18 of the 35 students that I teach in my studio actually started with another teacher, so they would be considered transfer students. I don't particularly love that name, but I also can't think of a better one. So in this video today, I'm going to share some notes about what I've picked up from working with transfer students, some of the common challenges, uh, how I've overcome them, and some um, obvious do not do with transfer students, and I'll save that for the end of the video. If you don't know who I am, my name's Drake. I teach a studio of 35 in Ithaca, New York, at Ithaca Talent Education. Um, I make these videos for transparency and also to encourage you to share uh, your notes so I can learn from you too. So uh, when I was reflecting on this video in particular, I, it occurred to me that I really love teaching transfer students, and I was trying to figure out why, and I think it comes down to three reasons. The first is that if somebody has started with somebody else and then they opt to come to your studio, especially if you're a Suzuki teacher with pretty high expectations, that child and that parent, that family, is really recommitting to this practice and process. They're saying, I really want to do that. And it's so sweet to get started with beginners, but they really don't know what they're doing. So by the time they've decided to start again, you know that they really mean it. Another reason is that um, you can get a student who is quite upside down and really their body is really confused about how the violin works and which is a few changes you can turn them around to being fantastic players with the students who i start it's pretty methodical progress from one to the other uh, we only do overhauls every once in a while with a transfer student we can do a complete renovation of their playing and it's extremely satisfying for me and finally, number three, um, if they were having a bad experience before, it is possible to completely redefine their relationship to the violin and how they think of themselves and their identity as musicians. Um, and I can't think of many better things to be able to do for a child than to do that, to imbue them with a sense that I can be a musician, violin is possible for me, and violin is something that I enjoy. So let me just describe uh, the initial phone conversation that I have with any person who's joining the studio, but especially if they've, they're coming from somebody else. Um, I hop on the phone with them, I think it does a lot better than email, and I ask them first question, why Suzuki, why now? And uh, you'll learn a lot from that phone call. And, and you'll often get a sense if they really um, understand the method and really want to participate in um, your version of the Suzuki method. There are two things that I share right away myself in that phone conversation just to set the tone. I, I borrowed this from Dinah Staggs. This is the four pillars that must be in place in order for us to do our work. First is that you listen to the recording every day. The second, that you come to your lesson every week. The third, that you come to your group lesson every single week. And the last is that you practice every day. All of my teaching, my whole sequence, my whole methodology is built around those four things. If those four things can be in place, I can all but guarantee that violin will be easy for you, or a foregone conclusion, you will be able to play the violin. If you're not able to do those four, then I don't know if our studio is gonna be the best fit. And then the other thing that I say is that, uh, you know, you might move, you might change your mind, your relationship with the instrument might change, but I'm committing to you until you turn 18. So if the child is coming to me at the age of five, that's a 13 year commitment that I am giving to that child. Um, and that shows, especially since they're coming from someone else, the seriousness with which I take our relationship in the studio. Usually when I start a brand new beginner, I'm doing three parent-teacher lessons at the beginning of our experience together. Uh, with a transfer student, I usually just do one. And in that one lesson where it's just me and the parent, I'm going to talk about a few things. The first is just a brief description of like the foundational piece of the Suzuki philosophy, which is that we're modeling it on language acquisition, and we're trying to build an environment around the student rather than um, forcing them or telling them what to do. Um, I will also uh, just kind of clarify exactly how lessons, group lessons, review, listening, recitals, concerts, summer lesson, all, how all of it works for the family because it can be pretty overwhelming to just jump right into our, our school. And then the last thing is that I will, I'll tell the parent, you, you know, you are the expert on your child, tell me about them. Um, and I like this because it means that the exchange goes both ways, it's not just me spouting information to them. Um, and I genuinely find the information helpful. So I have them tell me, um, you know, what the students' favorite foods are, what the students, uh, if they play any other interests, what their favorite characters are, movies, um, et cetera, et cetera. So those are things that I can grab right away and start to build a bridge to the student in our first lesson. So speaking of which, in the first lesson, 
I'm gonna do three things. One is that I'm gonna show them this is the way our studio works. This is what our studio culture is. This is how we do things around here. This could be a, an amazing opportunity to just completely reset expectations and restart their journey with the violin. So even little things like your shoes go here, your violin goes here, we're gonna put our papers and books here. Um, that can be really meaningful for the student. I'll often say things like, in our studio we do this. Um, like, in our studio we play our book one review pieces every day. Or, in our studio we're gonna start with reading so that we don't forget it. Stuff like that. Next thing is I'll have them play something easy for me, hopefully it's easy, and then I'll, I'll ask permission. I'll say, can I tell you everything that I'm enjoying about your playing? Usually, sheepishly, they'll say, oh, okay, and then I just go down. Like, I go down, down the list of all of the things that I'm loving, because there's always something working well um, in a student's playing. And then last, I'll, um, I'll usually say I have two projects that I want to start, um, two kind of upgrades or renovations that I want to make to your playing which do you want to do first? So I'll give them the option. Do you want to do a violin hand project? Do you want to do a bow hand project? Do you want to do an intonation project? Um, Etc. And I'll, I'll let them guide. And then we'll give, we'll invest like a full month or six weeks into really exploring that project, seeing it to completion, and then seeing how much transformation they can make in a very short period of time. I personally, um, and this gets into kind of wider themes or theories of, of working with transfer students, I don't think it's a good idea to strip away everything, start at Twinkle, and build up. Um, I personally, um, well, I guess I haven't done it, and it, to me it, it comes off as uh, demoralizing or demotivating unless you have <coughs> a student who's coming in asking for that. So usually I will, I'll say something like, um, you know, what is the one project they want to work on? And then when we do that project, I don't say, we're going to go back to the beginning. I just say, you know, we're going to start with our body, we're going to model, imitate, you know, the same way that I would teach a twinkler, the same sequence, um, but not the same language, um, and also not treating it as we're restarting over from the beginning. One particular challenge that's a little tricky at our school is that oftentimes my students, 35 students, at this school don't have group class with me. Group classes are taught by all the faculty members at this school at the school, but um, our studio is split up based on age um, and uh, ability of where they are in those classes. So if I'm taking on a transfer student, and let's say they're in early book two or late book one, I'm actually not going to teach their group class. And so uh, it begs the question of like, do you have transfer students play in group class? Yes. Um, and do they need to memorize and learn all the Suzuki pieces? In order to make them feel most confident in group class, I actually am going to have them learn Suzuki pieces. What I've done recently is communicated closely with the teacher about what the most important review pieces will be for that block or that semester, um, and then go straight there with the students first. I found that um, most of the students I've taken on are hungry to learn how to learn by ear and are really interested in trying to learn how to play something. Kind of connect the dots of how to learn by ear and then apply that right away to learning the pieces that are most important to the group class teacher, and then have them slowly start participating. I also give them instructions for what to do in class when there's a piece going on that they don't know, that they can simply sit down or remove themselves from the group, get out their bow, practice their bowing on the shoulder, or practice fingering along without making noise. Um, and then that's basically um, an hour a week for their brain to be acting like a sponge and soaking up everything they could possibly learn about the pieces that they haven't yet gotten a chance to really internalize. Okay, here are my three things that I would never ever do with a transfer student. Number one, never steal a student. So when the parents reach out to me, I clarify, have you already had a conversation with your prior teacher about this transition? You did? Okay, great. Can you give me their contact information so that I can call them and talk to them and we can have the smoothest transition possible? And then I really do that. I will never take on a student from another teacher without talking to that teacher. Because you never know and you want to maintain your um, reputation in the community. Even if somebody comes to me and says, hey, I'm interested in studying with you, um, in multiple cases, actually in many cases, um, I've often said, you know, we've had some great experiences in group class, we've had some great one-time lessons, and that's what those experiences are for. One-time buoys to lift you up. 
studio teaching over the long haul is a different experience and you know I recommend you continuing to work through things with your current teacher and stuff like that. Um, number two, I would never ever disparage their former teacher say I can't believe your teacher taught you like that or I might say I have a different way that's fine but you don't want to make the student feel or the family feel like um, they were doing the wrong thing before or they were with the wrong person before or even the teachers are wrong you know we just all have different ways and different strategies and we don't know what that teacher was thinking and then the last thing is I'm never gonna tell a student or send a student backwards um, all of our lifelong journeys uh, are you know wild and not um, vertical and so I'm going to acknowledge that, right? We're starting from where we are, and we're going to do what's best for us today, in the present moment. And um, that just means the next step forward. Nothing in learning is backwards learning. Okay, I hope that's helpful. I hope it resonates with you. Um, and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks.